Hey everyone, welcome to another interview. Liam here with a, another Australian guest for a change. I have Mark Brett, he's coming us from down in Melbourne. Mark, welcome along. Good to be with you. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Mark Brett is a professor of Old Testament or, or professor of Hebrew Bible and research coordinator at Whitley College, part of the University of Divinity. Uh, he's the author of Biblical Criticism in Crisis, Genesis, Procreation and the Politics of Identity, Decolonizing God, the Bible and the Tides of Empire. He is the editor of Ethnicity and the Bible. And today we're talking primarily about his new work from 2016, Political Trauma and Healing, Biblical Ethics for a Post-Colonial World, which uh, came out in 2016 through Erdman's and is fantastic. So that's a bit about you, Mark, uh, or professionally and rightly. What else do we need to know about you before we get started? Oh, probably that I was brought up in Papua New Guinea, so that gives me a bit of a different perspective, I think, to most Anglo-Australians. So mm. that was my, my home country. Mm. So coming to terms of being an Australian was a long, uh, yeah, long and complex process. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm excited to get into how that uh, experience and that theology and culture coming together uh, influences your work. So that'd be really fun to explore. Now, uh, people who uh, watch our interviews know that sometimes what we like to do with some of our guests uh, to help wade into their work, uh, for those who have not encountered it before, is do a little uh, conceptual rapid fire. Uh, it's my own little, uh, uh, you know, TV game show that I like to play. Uh, either this is for those who have never heard the term before, or maybe you've heard the term and you're using it on a semi-regular basis, but you're actually not entirely certain what it means, but it's too late to ask, uh, which is usually my situation. So what I'm going to ask you is for, I'm going to say a term and uh, what I'm after is your best preferably tweetable uh, definition of that term. And um, okay. basically these are terms that people write entire books on. So it's, it's deliberately impossible, uh, but I'm, I'm here for your best take. So the first one I'd love to know is, is colonialism. Uh, how about the extraction of resources from an empire's periphery? Love that. There we go. See, this is what we get. Nuggets of gold. This is what conceptual lightning round is all about. Uh, Post-colonialism. Well, that's, that's kind of a mixture of uh, indigenous cultures and colonial cultures, but um, kind of brokered under just conditions, processes and, and uh, practices. Right, right. I hope people are tweeting these out as they're watching. Uh, <laughs> biblical ethics. Well, I, that's kind of two-way street. So there's... there's um, collections of biblical notions, ideas in the Bible itself, but uh, turning it around to how we might use those, it's a, it's a kind of thoughtful integration of the multiplicity of biblical principles. Oh, that was some good one there. I like that. Uh, from the title, uh, Political Trauma. Uh, I, think, I guess people have uh, a basic idea of trauma, and I'm just distinguishing between the personal kind where you might have a, um, a life-threatening illness or a car accident, and the inherently social or political kind, which arises from, say, ethnic violence or something like that. Yep. Right. And the final one is justice. Ah, oh, too hard. <laughs> um, there's, there's just so many conceptions of, of justice, like, you know, procedural justice or distributive justice, fair distribution of resources or, or uh, retributive, you know, just punishment. But I think the, the overriding biblical one would be restorative justice. So through any of those processes to arrive at a restoration of relationships. Oh, great. See, we got there in the end. I, I, I try to make them really hard, but you, you, you sailed through that. If we ever do this again, I'll really have to scratch my noggin as to what terms to throw at you. But uh, that was fantastic. Um, I also like, I think it's a, it is a, a perfectly reasonable biblical answer to just be like, and, uh, and uh, leave yeah. it there, like, you know, um, yeah, like, or ask me a question, yeah. I guess. <laughs> That's what yeah. Jesus would do. Just tell a story or ask me a question and we should be fine. Right. Uh, so turning to your book, uh, which I mentioned before, Political Trauma mm -hmm. and Healing, uh, could you give us a little overview to start of what the work is about and, and one thing you were really hoping that readers would take away from it? I guess the, the term post-colonial in the title uh, means that I'm having a go at... at uh, kind of engaging with the colonial legacies, particularly in Australia. It's a very Australian book, but uh, American publisher and I've, I've gone through and, and kind of linked it to other international or global perspectives that, that have analogies uh, with our own. Um, but yeah, the Bible's got a complex collection of literatures that has mixed legacy for, for good and for evil. And I'm trying to provide 
uh, a reading of the Bible's complexity that can still have um, really constructive and healing potential for um, churches today. But beyond churches can, can uh, uh, kind of encourage Christians to engage more constructively in public space under more kind of humble conditions without assuming that we're going to tell people what we do, what, what to do as we might have done in the days of Christendom. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great goal to be going for. Um, and I really have been appreciating uh, the Australian context and the deeply rooted Australian examples that get cited. I mean, so many books you read, you know, just because of the nature of the industry come from America. And so there's this, the great examples and the great, um, you know, theory, but it's like, then you have to do this like, kind of step to apply to our context. And, and so starting with that, and there are still plenty of international uh, examples. So, I mean, anywhere you're reading this, you'll appreciate it and take something away. But I have just been appreciating the, uh, yeah, the Australian stuff. Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of tradition um, when white people do theology in Australia that they, they keep tipping the hat to Europe and America. Mm. Uh, and I, I think we've got to stop doing that. There you go. I think that's a good lesson, yeah. Uh, okay, so looking at the book uh, more specifically now, on, um, on page 27, uh, for those following at home, uh, you write about how post-colonial theology might contribute to secular democratic conversations in a way that involves both repentance of collusion with colonialism and resistance to new temptations to exercise mastery over others, even if that comes from a democratic majority. I was wondering if you could expand just a little on this to begin with. Well, I think we've got to acknowledge um, the legacies of, of uh, the Christian tradition uh, and not sort of thoughtlessly trade on them. So as a matter of fact, I know a lot of Christians feel anxious and hemmed in uh, here in Australia, Britain, and, and particularly in America. Um, but I think we've got to get over it because we still have the democratic majority, even if our majority is still only, I don't know, 60% instead of 70% now. Um, we're still the majority. <laughs> uh, so we've got some, some ferocious antagonism in Australia arising from more militant secularism in the sense of anti-religious secularism. There's also uh, a multi-religious secularism uh, and we need to engage more humbly with that, that mix uh, without presuming we need to tell people what to do. Uh, and in the public space, that means finding... Um, collaborators finding some common ground with other religious traditions and other ethical traditions where we can work together to overcome the legacies of colonialism and other sorts of problems which are kind of notoriously in the press from week to week. Mm. Yeah, well, one of the things I was thinking about that following this thread is, um, so this semester with our groups at uni, we're exploring uh, reconciliation as a, as a broad theme for the semester. And I was wondering how this, these post-colonial contributions would play out, for instance, in the conversation around the Australian reconciliation efforts. Uh, you write later in the book that it is not difficult to find reasons why reconciliation might be regarded as a hollow discourse in the public domain. So how can this kind of approach help um, you know, address that and, and counter that hollowness? Mm. Well, I, I was there down in, in Fed Square in Melbourne when Kevin Rudd did, did his apology. Uh, and it was a very moving people. I was with Aboriginal people. I was working with an Aboriginal organisation at the time. Um, but what followed didn't seem to be consistent over the next years, didn't seem to be consistent with that apology. Mm -hmm. So any, any uh, sort of substan substantial political theory of reconciliation has got to bring some, some depths and alternative perspectives rather than just apology. That's a, that's a, a public apology, particularly from a government, can be extraordinarily significant, but then uh, that government needs to follow thing through with things like reparations mm -hmm. and restoration of culturally significant land uh, and the establishment of just institutions so that people can feel appropriately represented if they've been displaced and marginalised for uh, wrongful reasons, such as the wrongful assertion of, of British sovereignty in Australia then we need to find institutions where the rightful acknowledgement uh, of those historic injustices can be brought to bear in, say, a parliamentary process or the, um, the consultation processes of local government uh, and the proper acknowledgement of Aboriginal organisations in ongoing political life and so on. Mm -hmm. And churches have a role in that, but it's a, it's a larger public conversation that we uh, within the churches need to participate in. Yeah, I think that's a great point. 
Um, early in the book, uh, you indicate your reading of scripture as a quote, a series of socially embodied arguments rather than a single meta narrative. Uh, mm. I'm very excited about that phrase. I'd love to be able to work it into a dinner conversation and know what it means. Uh, so if you could just ex expand on that a little more for me and, uh, and for us, I shouldn't say this is all for me, for everyone, guys, this is why I'm doing it, um, okay. and how it may fit with post-colonial theology more broadly. Okay, so I guess if you're having a dinner party with philosophers, they would know that term, meta-narrative, uh, and they would, they would know that, that one of the famous um, definitions of postmodernism includes uh, a kind of doubt or incredulity towards meta-narrative. What's meta-narrative? It's the big story that swallows up all the small stories. So there is a, there is a conception of the Christian gospel that, that sees it as one big story that's capable of swallowing up all the other small stories. Um, and that's a very unfortunately imperialist way of understanding the Bible. Uh, and when I read the details of the different um, strands of tradition and conversations in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, um, it strikes me that that, that single meta narrative um, approach is an oversimplification uh, of, of rather more complex conversations that are happening within the Hebrew Bible. There are streams of, of, of a kind of national tradition, uh, but there are international traditions as well. Uh, and and you, you, can, you can have a priestly theology that still acknowledges the possibility that every human being is made in the image of Elohim. And that's an interesting choice of words. It's, it's that generic word like, di like divinity in English, as opposed to um, the Lord, capital letters, Yahweh, the name of Israel's national God. Uh, so even a priestly theologian is able to uh, envisage a universal human solidarity and to acknowledge that the way that God is named might be different depending on which tradition you 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 sit within. So, um, yeah, I, I could go on. Maybe ask me another question, and I'll I'll develop that particular tradition in a particular way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, well, kind of moving into again with the post-colonial critiques. Um, in the first section, you draw attention to post-colonial critiques of human rights. Um, particularly individualised human rights. Um, at the end of the chapter, Limits and Possibilities of Secular Theology, you offer a Christian understanding of human rights as something that, quote, provokes agape into an ever-widening canonic embodiment of intercultural communion. Yeah. Another great phrase. Um, what are some of these critiques post-colonialism lays at the feet of human rights? And how might this Christian understanding act as a response to these critiques? Okay, so there are, there are some classic post-colonial critiques of the, the kind of manipulation of human rights, of course, which um, um, is really a kind of mask for American interests and American political ideas that they might want to implant in other contexts. I, I say American, but that might be um, British ideals. Uh, there's a, there's a, a strong, diverse Indian um, literature, as in from the country of India, uh, that resists some of the human rights discourse, even um, from the from the um, English um, kind of theoreticians, and yet Indian democracy borrowed in part from those English ideals. But they basically said that's a great idea, but you didn't really live up to it. Mm -hmm. So you talk vaguely about human uh, equality, but you manage to leave out uh, all sorts of ethnic groups. Um, so. On Indian soil, Western ideals of democracy grew into a more kind of mature and more inclusive um, kind of articulation. The same thing happened in America, of course. You know, this inspiring Amer American declaration of independence that could talk about God-given human rights, um, but then managed to leave out black people and women. Uh, so in the course of time, the prejudices that are laid down in human rights philosophy have been uncovered in various contexts by various, you know, in different generations where we're rethinking the significance of these ideas of human rights. So trying to avoid the cultural impositions, ethnocentric impositions or gendered impositions, uh, which people just didn't notice. Uh, so you need to debate in particular contexts the unintended consequences of talking about human rights. And one of, the, one of the most significant ones in our context is the assumption that human rights are, are primarily individual, uh, whereas Aboriginal societies are collectivists and more inherently social. 
So the idea of cultural rights and social rights need to be articulated and given uh, the same kind of weight uh, and, and kind of legal implications have to be teased out in a different way to, to, to embrace those social dimensions. So collective rights for land holding, collective rights for holding natural resources. These are things that Western human rights um, have often not been able to grasp. Although in recent years, particularly in South Africa, where the legal minds have been working at this after apartheid went down, uh, they have been um, finding legal instruments to recognise collective rights, uh, in traditional indigenous knowledge and so on. Um, and those sorts of analogies um, from the our South African context could apply in our context in all sorts of ways, which I think we haven't yet achieved. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, Another thing you write is uh, that the church is called to embody the integration of justice and love, agape, in ever-expanding networks of relationships across national and cultural traditions, caring for those in need, whether they're inside or outside of the Christian community. Uh, again, that's a lovely picture. Uh, I was wondering whether you had a story or example of a community where you've seen this kind of thing lived out. Um. I can't give particular names, but there are churches in Melbourne uh, which I have experienced uh, in their common life. They're able to embrace um, Muslim uh, community members in various ways, either uh, within the heart of, of church life, where, where people are trying to articulate their faith in Jesus from a Muslim perspective, or more broadly in support for people who continue to identify more kind of unapologetically as, as Muslims. Um, so that kind of rich embrace of people without worrying whether they have converted in a conventional sense or not remain with their Muslim identity, that's something I've seen um, firsthand in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. But to me, one of, the, one of the most dramatic inspirational stories is being played out as we speak in Lebanon, where um, a country that has one in four of its population as a refugee, uh, I, I get regular emails from, from Lebanon, from the Baptist College there, and from the, some of the other organisations from the churches who are supporting population more generally. Mm. Uh, and there's, there's, there's not this sense that you sometimes hear in the media that people are kind of trying to sort out whether they're Christian or Muslim. They're just refugees uh, from Syria, overwhelmingly from Syria. Uh, so just imagine if Melbourne, a quarter of Melbourne's population were refugees and half of them were Muslim, um, then you're getting close to what the everyday lived reality of my Baptist colleagues in, in Lebanon are living with. Yeah. I think that's inspirational. Yeah, no, that is great. It's great to hear that and that... Yeah, where so much of the, the narrative we hear about refugees is, is determining, you know, what religious background should we prioritise, and namely yeah. that which matches the democratic majority. Uh, it's, it's encouraging to hear our stories that are challenging that. Mm. Um, so a, a generalised idea, I kind of think I tend to hear, like, thrown around a bit uh, when people make, make a distinction between Israel and the church kind of thing, like what Israel was in the Old Testament and what the church is in the New is yeah. kind of like this idea that okay, Israel, that was like the internally focused, it was about taking care of your own, and then the church comes along and they were concerned about taking care of everyone and it didn't matter, you know, it was a universalised, non-ethnic kind of thing. So it's this kind of nationally focused but it's universally focused. Uh, now, in the book, you explore the contested nature of this ethno, uh, ethnocentrism in Israel itself. So how might your exploration of the Hebrew scriptures challenge or problematize this kind of general distinction? Mm. Well, I think it's pretty clear when you study the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament in any detail, you can see that there are, there's an ongoing tension between a more national focus and a more international um, scope. And you can find that in many layers of the tradition, many of the different biblical books. And a book like Job is entirely about a foreigner. Um, who's very wise and has wonderful ethics and, mm. and so on. So that's, that's for, written in Hebrew for a Jewish audience and saying, look, consider, consider um, this person, Job. She's, he's actually an extraordinarily exemplary uh, 
human being who can arrive at these um, wonderful ethics, much like our own in terms of social justice on the basis of relating to a creator whose who's, um, name is nothing like our national name, doesn't have our national covenant, etc., etc. So that's Old Testament theology, mm -hmm. Hebrew Bible theology. Um, so the church builds on a more kind of um, particularly Pauline um, ideal of intercultural relationships uh, and that ideal ideal is wonderful, and I've actually seen it face to face on many occasions. But the history of of the Christian Church has been against its theory and theology, repeatedly ethnocentric. Uh, and you can still go to churches all over Melbourne, all over Sydney, uh, and you'll find that the vast majority of the people there are of the same ethnic group. Uh, so, in practice. Many churches are ethnocentric, even though their theological theory suggests that they shouldn't be. Uh, so I think there are kind of particularist and universalist tendencies, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament and in the synagogues and in the churches. And these tensions need to be worked out case by case. Mm. Uh, you know, look at the, the, um, the particular examples of lived experience rather than theorise generally about an ethnocentric Old Testament and a more universalistic New Testament, uh, which doesn't actually prove to be true on closer inspection. Yeah, great. I think that, like, that's important to problematise a lot of those distinctions. Like, you know, the, like, I mean, the classic is like the works grace kind of one, as if grace was a concept that only um, emerges in the first century of the common era kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Uh, in the uh, final section of your book, uh, you engaging the present, uh, you explore um, four different topics, reconciliation and sovereignty, migration, ecology, and economics and redemption. Mm. Uh, an effort that runs through all four chapters is the use of both post-colonial readings of the Hebrew scriptures and engagements with indigenous knowledge. Mm. Uh, could you expand on this method a little, what drew you to it, and how it uh, influenced your insights into these complex and vital issues of our time. Okay, so I guess one of the characteristic errors of, of colonial theology was a blindness to indigenous knowledge and a, and a tendency to demonize it as um, simply pagan and so on. Uh, and in the course of a history of colonial Christianity and colonial um, government, Indigenous knowledge was left to one side, and that was actually, um, in hindsight, looking back, we can see that there were both theological and kind of political economic errors made when that um, when that happened. There is so much in Indigenous knowledge about, for example, uh, our relationship with the natural world, which in ecological theology these days we are um, rediscovering. And environmental science is discovering the wealth of um, knowledge about biodiversity and, and bioregions all across the planet by re-engaging with traditional knowledge where it's still um, you know, held by elders and so on. Uh, and I, I mentioned an example in South Africa. There are all sorts of, <laughs> all sorts of um, commercially exploited um, traditional knowledges which... Um, you know, people are discovering, oh, they, they knew that uh, a few thousand years ago. Uh, and if we'd only listened to them when we arrived, we might have been able to arrange these, um, the use of these resources on a much more um, fair and just basis. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the kind of South African example in the um, kind of commercial exploitation of traditional knowledge. But, but in Australia, traditional knowledge is also um, related to things like um, fire management across the continent. So our climate um, tradition, um, conditions have changed so dramatically that some of that traditional knowledge um, can't be applied perhaps in the same way as it might have been a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but there are all sorts of resources there uh, that we need careful, detailed conversation with elders to, to work through. What, what is it that they know about this place? Uh, that Anglo eyes have overlooked and uh, we're trying to repent of that. So I, I've had some experience of, of how that works out in um, political and economic 
dialogue about the rights of traditional owners in Victoria under native title legislation and, and discussions about land rights and the use of natural resources and so on. But there are direct analogies with how we should think about, if you like, spiritual um, resources. The spirituality of traditional Aboriginal Australia has remarkable things to contribute uh, to a church that has been um, kind of emptied out of its collectivist and social uh, mm -hmm. norms and reduced to a kind of individualist kind of spirituality uh, or, or the one that, that is during the week, an individualist one on Sundays, you get together with another bunch of people for that kind of marginal spiritual space on the edges of real life. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's something that Aboriginal spirituality can actually call us back to rethink what about the everyday reality of the use of natural resources? Isn't there a spiritual dimension to that? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is yes. What about the everyday um, experience of going to work? Isn't there a spiritual dimension to that? Um, so the best kind of theological reflection, of course, um, in case is, is breadth. Um, but a lot of our kind of habitual practice has these ethnocentric um, ways of reducing spiritual reality in a way that Aboriginal spirituality just doesn't, doesn't do. Uh, so I'm constantly encouraged by my um, Aboriginal friends and Aboriginal Christian friends who combine their, their traditional knowledge and their Christian identity in ways that I find constantly um, inspiring. Mm -hmm. So where historically colonial theology has left Aboriginal voices out of view, I think as a matter of theological method, you should turn that around and start with Aboriginal voices. Uh, and then um, bring in the larger con conversation of the biblical and Christian tradition into mm -hmm. a Christian identity. Uh, never leaving out of voices because you do so at your own peril. Yeah. How would you, like, so you've had experience working with communities, working with policy groups in this area, um, you know, being in the, the academy that there are, how would you recommend others begin with these voices if they're starting to think about, you know, a minister starting to think about their Sunday sermon or just a, a Christian at yeah. a church start to think about how they read scripture. How, how do you recommend they, how do you, what are some guides for how to do this process? Yeah, well, um, I think one, one basic thing to do is to work out um, whose traditional land your church is sitting on, for example. Um, who are the traditional owners of the country where you, where you live? Um, where are the Aboriginal organisations in the country where you live? Um, how do they describe themselves? Uh, so we, we speak generally about Aboriginal people, even Indigenous people, more abstractly. Um, but traditional owners will say, no, I'm, I'm Wurundjeri or Tanarong or Gunditjmara or Gunakurnai or whatever it is. They're, they're very specific names which um, many white people feel like they don't really need to bother with. It's too particular. I think you ought to. You ought to ask, who are these people? Where is their traditional country? Who are their elders? What stories do they um, have to tell? Uh, and, and from there, more kind of complex questions arise. How did your church property arrive in your possession? Um, in, in most cases, uh, there are considerable amounts of um, church property that, are, um, that were historically gifts of the Crown, uh, and yet the Crown has not taken that land by a legitimate process. So we have an historic debt uh, to pay. And finding ways to uh, repay for those that, that um, land that was wrongly taken in the first place, historically, it's a very complex process. And it requires getting to know your local traditional owners uh, and the other Aboriginal organisations that might be able to help you think through those, those things. Um, and along the way, um, Christians probably will need to talk to Aboriginal Christians about how they have dealt with those very questions. Because um, there are many Aboriginal Christians who live on their own traditional land, but there are other uh, Aboriginal Christians who live, say, in urban contexts, away from their traditional land, or they belong to stolen generations and their lineage is complex and unclear and so forth. Um, and they've had to go through all these questions. So learning from Aboriginal Christians how to address these historic um, injustices and so forth, that, that's part of our our task as well um, and of course the Australian um, demographic uh, 
means that that's a very small number of people in terms of percentages uh, and there's lots of Asian immigration and, and other kinds of multicultural uh, communities that we need to deal with. But I think it's a question of getting our, uh, uh, you know, the first questions dealt with first mm. and then expanding um, mm. outwards. And uh, there are lots of biblical resources to help us think this through. Uh, and people who have been trying to rethink the misuse of the Bible in the history of colonial uh, Christianity. Um, and yeah, there, there's no shortage of resources there if you have a will to um, mm. those issues through. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I was remembering when uh, you're meaning, uh, talking about listening to Aboriginal Christian uh, people who are living on lands that might not be their own. We, we chatted to Brooke Prentice a little while ago and she talked about the kind of dilemma she felt when buying a home um, you know, on a land that, that wasn't her traditional land. You know, she was from a different people and, and yeah, what went on there. And yeah, it was a really great lesson to we'll discuss that further going forward. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, just just staying with this thread just a little bit, um, what have like, you know, from some of those basic levels, what have been some of the things that like, how you've been able to look at the, the Hebrew Bible anew from learning from these voices who were colonized rather than like, you know, we, we tend to read, well, we can't avoid me speaking of myself, reading it through the eyes of someone who was part of the colonizing. And so you put that on, but that, that situation is often very different to a lot of the stories in the Hebrew Bible. Um, yeah. What have been some of like what are some of those key, you know, illuminations when you read it from the the underside, from the other side of the imperial colonial uh, engagement? Well, I've had I've had particular friends over the years, um, senior Aboriginal people who have been able to say, oh, you know that story about Naboth's vineyard? That's kind of like ours. There's a king trying to take traditional land. Uh, and the traditional owner says, no, no, far be it from me that, the, that I give up the inheritance of my ancestors. Um, and just really basic questions about how, who do you identify in that story will illuminate the fact that Aboriginal people feel like they're more like Naboth than the Israelite king. Mm. Uh, and that helps you reorientate yourself into the narrative in ways that don't presume that you're just basically like an Israelite um, or a new Israelite and you can read from the point of view of Israel. Well, no, we're Gentiles. We need to read the story from the point of view of Gentiles. Uh, and the, the ways in which these different perspectives can help open up the biblical narrative uh, have, for me, um, very often been provoked by conversations with Aboriginal people. Um, I remember having a... The, the first time I met Ginny in Gondara, I was up there in, in Darwin at a Native Title conference and a close friend of mine introduced me to him and uh, we sat and contemplated the ocean there uh, and he just said things like, oh, well, you know that story about Moses? That's an interesting story as an Aboriginal person. You know, he, he was able to engage with those Egyptian people. He even had an Egyptian name, Moshe. But actually, he was always on the lookout for how to how to save his people. Um, that's perspective on the Moses story that I never expected to come from an Aboriginal person. So just sitting down and listening, um, I have never seen the Moses story in quite the same way again. Um, if you don't have those conversations, you don't have the gift. You won't have those gifts, those fresh perspectives that they um, that these Aboriginal people will bring to us. Um, so there are hundreds of stories, hundreds of stories like that. But I have to say that um, as an Old Testament scholar, Hebrew Bible scholar, um, I've found over the years that I've also had to dig deep into historical studies and not stay with the surface of biblical narrative um, because there are some problems, some issues, how we understand the text which really can't be resolved unless you've got a sense of where those texts come from. Uh, for example, um, there are laws about genocide in Deuteronomy. Where do they come from historically? Uh, I think it's really important to work that out, the conditions under which those, those laws arise. And now I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced that they come from uh, a context in which Israel is engaged with uh, the Assyrian Empire uh, and its threatening kind of presence there to the north. Uh, and it's an engagement with that imperial discourse that you find played out in the book of Deuteronomy uh, 
um, often in very uncomfortable ways. Mm -hmm. But I think getting a getting a handle on the on those historical dynamics uh, essential, and that just takes some study. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah Grand Dawson. So if you want to study, uh, check out Whitley College and Mark's <laughs> courses to the University of Divinity. I'm a I University of Divinity student I myself. No, yeah, you know, and like I, I, I study it like just around the corner at Pilgrim. So like, if they find out that I'm shilling for Whitley, I'll get in a lot of trouble. But um, no, <laughs> the University okay, of Divinity is great. I have some good friends down there. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Love this collegiality. Uh, so maybe a, a final question. Um, in your chapter on economics and redemption, you often offer a personal aside about your work with an Aboriginal representative body on native title policy. Uh, and the reconstruction of traditional economies. Uh, I also know that Whitley College, where you teach, has a focus on uh, Indigenous engagement and intercultural studies. Uh, what's, you've already touched on this a bit, but what's been your experience working in these areas and, uh, and coming out of these experiences and the conversations? What are some of the things you'd love churches to be considering around their resources, their economies and their communities? You mentioned before about how your church got to be on the land that it is. But yeah, what are some, some other things that have come from this experience and this work? I, I think we've got some basic um, church history uh, to learn um, and to internalise. Uh, for example, um, historic Christianity right up to the Reformation basically thought that charging of interest was sinful. Uh, from the Reformation onwards, there are various alternatives imagined. Already in late medieval Catholic economic theology, there were models of sharing risk and investment and so forth. So as they were starting to think about more complex economic um, ethics from a Christian point of view. But basically, we, we have blessed capitalism in ways that no biblical or classical Christian author would have thought possible. Uh, and that, that takes some historical and theological work to get ourselves out of. Um, so... The capacity for global capitalism to exploit the poor, uh, and these days it's much easier to do because we don't have to look at them mm. when they're being paid terrible um, wages in, in India or China even, or um, places where they're far from view, but the inequities of their financial arrangements and economic arrangements um, you know, support us being able to make cheap purchases down the road at Target or whatever. Um, without those things being brought to view. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's really important for us as a church to think through the economic practices of our everyday lives and to see those matters as spiritual matters and not as merely material matters. Uh, yeah, there's, there's various ways we could, we could unpack that. But I think we've, we have a kind of thoughtless um, economic pattern of living which churches need to resist. And you can see really excellent examples, um, for example, in the, in the perhaps the Uniting Church, um, their, their um, justice advocacy officers um, are, are talking about um, tax and um, fair trade and so forth. Um, there's some, some great um, Baptist... Uh, thinkers in that area as well. The Not For Sale um, mm. international campaign, for example. Uh, Tim Costello is a great public um, exponent of, of um, fairer practices in, in um, economic um, spheres of life. Um, there are just so many layers to this. Uh, just bringing things to the surface takes some historical awareness and theological uh, sensitivity. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think, you know, local churches need to think about what, what uh, financial contributions they might need to make to Aboriginal organisations as a, as a way of making good, uh, as a way of sort of providing some reparations for, for the sins of the, the fathers, as it were. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that I can unpack that any further, unless you've got some specific examples you want to go into a little further. I teach a class, um, I have taught a class a few times at Pilgrim, um, or it was UFT at that point, mm. uh, United Faculty at that point, um, called Economics, Justice and Theology. And we've looked at Old Testament economic practice, New Testament, uh, 
the history of Christian um, ethics and some of the various theological engagements with um, economic models today. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's a complex area, but it's, it's um, not studied as much as it, as it should be. But mm -hmm. I think the, the integrity of the Christian witness requires us to think these things through. Otherwise, we just collapse into the dominant culture. And what makes us particular is basically just what we do on Sundays when we go to church. That's what makes us stand out. Well, that's not really good enough. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good challenge. I think economics and, and, and capitalism it gets ignored a lot because it's just, well, that's just the air we breathe and it's hard to imagine anything else. But yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, it has, it, it affects, it's the kind of the lens through which all so many other issues hang. Yeah. Mm. Mm. We had a, yeah, another thing, we, a talk we had where we were, someone was pointing out just the way we can't even read the parables of Jesus outside of a kind of capitalist lens. Like and someone did a reading of the parable of the talents, which, you know, about this hard master making, trying to make as much interest and much money off little things as possible. And like yeah. totally owns that I'm a hard and, you know, unscrupulous man or whatever it is, the, the thing. And like, but we're like, Oh, that master must be good because he's trying to make money. And that's what we are meant to be doing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's a wonderful example. You, you should have earned interest. And then we think somehow that character might stand for God in some way. Mm. No, no, not possible. Not possible. The original telling of that narrative, everybody would have known the charging of interest was sinful. There, were, there was mosaic law against it. So when he says you should have charged, you know, earned interest, he was recommending something that was unthinkable to uh, the, the followers of Jesus who knew those Jewish laws. Mm. They knew that that was wrong. So they couldn't read the parable that way. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's as you say. The reason we need to be examining the historical and the, the, what's going yeah. on behind the text is, yeah, and so we can start to you know really look anew at the systems and structures that we're a part of and asking if they, yeah. I, yeah. I should also clarify that I'm not a not a fundamentalist in the sense that oh, we need to go back to biblical mm -hmm. um, economic models, never charge interest, and possibly have slaves and so on. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we need to think through the implications of those biblical models for how we structure our mm -hmm. economic life today. Uh, and if I think, I think Kelvin, um, John Kelvin in Reformation times was, was, was sifting um, competing visions. Do we want a slave based society or do we want to have loans um, on balance? We probably prefer to have loans than a slave based society. How are we going to make that um, equitable? How are we going to make that fair? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing you might do is make sure that, that um, the lender doesn't have ex, um, exploitative uh, regulations on their sides that you might you know, share risk, for example, uh, which was a, was a classical Christian um, economic theological idea. Uh, but these days, that idea of sharing risk uh, is virtually un, unheard of. Um, sorry, I'm generalising. But um, uh, it's not that we can just take biblical economic models and immediately apply them. But our economic ethical imagination has to be expanded by the basic concerns that are expressed there in the biblical material. And we need to bring those to our economic arrangements so that we, we, we work through what is more fair and less fair, what would lead to more um, distributive justice, uh, what, what would lead to more kind of restorative social um, models of well-being that... that, that um, really enrich the common the common good, um, rather than thinking that economics you just you just do that in the way the dominant culture suggests, and then you give your money to build your church or give your money to your overseas missions, and we've dealt with all those economic dimensions in Christian faith, uh, and there's no problems left over. Mm -hmm. um, no, there's there's some problems left over that we yeah. need to deal with. Yeah, and as you said, there's there are enormous resources there. You know. Um, I did some work on like, you know, like reparations through like, you know, the Hebrew scriptures, like, you know, like you kind of in Leviticus, like, you know, guilt offerings and like, you know, making financially right with the person you've wronged before you can get right with God and, and, and Jubilee. And these, these traditions are there, which, yeah, but we, um, but because we are so embedded in this system and uh, one of the really wise things that were pointed out to me was like, no one, even like the great, you know, people who make films, no one can really envision a, a world that's not capitalist. Like whenever any movie set in the future is either capitalist or an apocalyptic wasteland, um, <laughs> you know, it's either like it's still capitalist or it's all destroyed. Like there's no like it's so it's such a you know we might be able to imagine a world without 
you know, racism. We might be able to imagine a world without sexism, or a world where the ecology is back in normal, but the, the capitalism one seems very hard to shake. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems yeah. like good prophetic work to be doing in your churches, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, people, I, I cannot recommend this highly enough. Um, it's, it's really great. It's got um, yeah, biblical reflections. It's, it's got these uh, engaging the present sections, which tackle a lot of really interesting issues. Great discussion on democracy and the way and justice in colonial times. It's, it's a really excellent work. So I definitely ch I recommend checking that out. Um, yeah. Mark, are there other ways people can connect with you or, or connect with your work? Um, sure. We, we um, do quite a bit of teaching online. So, for example, this semester I'm teaching a class called Justice and the Prophets, and the, there are people in other states that are able to do that. Um, you know, we have MP3s of, the, of sound um, files for the lectures and reading online and so forth. So you don't have to meet, uh, live in Melbourne in order to study at Whitley. So I'll, I'll just give a little blurb like that. That's but there nice. are also conference opportunities I, I tend to... Um, kind of facilitate conferences most years where we have Aboriginal people come to um, Melbourne to speak and this coming July we've, we've got um, some Native American theologians coming in and uh, teaching um, the Bible and and theology through uh, Indigenous lenses um, so we we try to make those kinds of opportunities available to people through Whitley's um, uh, teaching and learning programs. Oh, excellent. If people want to find out more about that conference, will they just Whitley's website? Would that have info? Or? Whitley's website, yeah. So there's some um, there's a mission studies conference called uh, Discover or Reimagining Home, mm -hmm. and uh, there's some Indigenous streams within that, uh, and then there's the uh, Native American theologians who are delivering three intensive units of study around the same time, mm -hmm. uh, and we're also engaging in. Uh, consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations in early July um, as well. So there's a lot of stuff happening yeah. early July. That's exciting. So people, if you've got some uh, professional development you need to do or you want to go on a retreat, like this is this is the time. Check out Melbourne down in July and, uh, and get along to that. Well, uh, Professor Mark Brett, thank you very much for joining us today and, uh, and sharing with us your insight and wisdom. And uh, yeah, look forward to connecting with you and look forward to discussing this in groups, everyone. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Liam.